More importantly, in one of my other lives over recent years in working with the Ministry of Health, I was very much involved in a lot of the issues around prostate cancer and in particular was an advisor to the um, Parliamentary Health Select Committee when it was undertaking its considerations around prostate cancer. And when that started off, the initial mandate was to look at localised or early prostate cancer. But after a number of what I can call really impassioned presentations, actually notably by the partners and wives of some men who'd had advanced prostate cancer, and the stories they told, it was agreed, look, actually, we need to look at the whole pathway from front to end, not just the front of the pathway. And so as a result of that, uh, the task force then went on and actually considered a whole area around the management of both advanced and metastatic prostate cancer. And two recommendations came out of that, which I hope will see some implementation over the next few years. One was around developing some guidance or guidelines for New Zealand around managing metastatic prostate cancer. And the second was to establish a, a work group to actually look at, look at the issues. So I'm pleased to be able to do this presentation as a, as a bit of a backup from the messages. Now, metastatic prostate cancer is an awful problem if you get it. But one of the difficulties in its management, it's very heterogeneous. From men who will have metastases who are largely asymptomatic, through to men who will have very widespread disease, who can suffer very severely from the effects of the cancer. Now when we think that one in five men with prostate cancer will die of their prostate cancer, that means most of those men who die are going to have metastatic disease before they die. So one in five men in this country, as best we can estimate, at least will have metastatic prostate cancer. But remember, there are some men with metastatic prostate cancer who are actually not going to die of that cancer. They're going to be living with it and may live with some of the significant consequences. So it produces high morbidity and we've got to remember that if we look at our Maori population, they have an even higher rate of presenting with advanced uh, metastatic prostate cancer. So, we know that probably somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of men who present will have metastatic prostate cancer at presentation. I'm told that the Midlands study said in the Midlands it's about 12 percent of men. We know the proportion has been falling as of course we have had more and more men presenting with early prostate cancer because of PSA testing. When we look at metastatic prostate cancer, and I'm going to stick to look, talking about metastatic prostate cancer. When we talk about advanced prostate cancer, remember there are another group of men who I'm going to, well not ignore, but not going to talk about today, who have locally advanced prostate cancer. It doesn't actually metastasize elsewhere, but it's locally advanced and can cause significant problems. In terms of metastatic prostate cancer, bone is the predominant site to where prostate cancer will spread. Just another other statistics is that once you do have metastatic prostate cancer, your survival is actually relatively short, with reported internationally around 24 to 36 months median survival. Now again, we don't know what the data is in New Zealand, but I suspect it may look somewhat worse than that, given that some of this data may be based on kind of some highly selective uh, studies. What we do know, though, is a proportion of men, probably about one in five, and 20 percent, it's an easy figure to remember, actually will live longer, will live quite a number of years with their metastatic disease. So historically, we can look at metastatic prostate cancer, and there are a number of groups of men to consider. Firstly, there are men who've got metastases who may have quite limited disease, who actually may be asymptomatic. 
And the issues of managing those men are clearly going to be quite different from the men who are very symptomatic and got widespread metastases. We also have men who are asymptomatic who do actually have widespread metastases. So it's very heterogeneous and depending on the extent of your disease at presentation and other factors such as your performance status, uh, depending on whether you had a high grade prostate cancer to start with or whether it was low grade, can also affect how long it is likely you're going to survive once you develop your metastatic disease. So bone is the predominant site with all those sorts of clinical problems that can arise, bone pain, pathologic fractures, um, spinal cord compression from spine metastases, nerve root compression, and men with more advanced bone disease who can run into bone marrow problems. However, not to forget that some men will get metastases to other sites apart from bone. So the focus is not solely on managing the problems arising from cancer in bone. A proportion of men will get lymph node metastases and that can result in problems with edema, particularly limb edema, problems with pain, uh, nodes within the abdomen, retroperitoneum can lead to problems with uh, um, kidney obstruction and renal failure. Some men will get liver metastases and run into the problems that result from liver dysfunction quite unusual lung metastases but they, they do occur and can cause clinical problems. And one of the things about metastatic prostate cancer can be the general systemic effects that that cancer can have. So not necessarily just the local effects of the cancer but the profound effects in terms of fatigue and weight loss. And of course that can be one of the problems that men can get the fatigue and problems like that and equally the, some of the treatments we have also can have that as a, as a, as a side effect. So what does metastatic prostate cancer and bone look like? This is a plain x-ray, we don't see so many of that these days, but the classical appearance of a very dense, uh, whoops, I'll try and, uh, of a very dense vertebral body, just sort of a white vertebral body, is, is classical or typical for metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, bone scan or bone scintigraphy, which has been widely used for assessing extent of bone involvement, um, but perhaps to some extent now replaced by the um, other imaging modalities of CT scanning, and this is a, oops, again push the wrong button, a, a CT scan of a vertebral body, and you can see a dense sclerotic metastasis and another one here in, in a vertebral body. So CT imaging can be a, a good way of assessing bone involvement. And if we go on, um, MRI scanning is proving invaluable in terms of the assessment and particularly not only to look at extent of involvement in bone and here we can see on MRI scan the appearance of a metastasis which in fact we don't even see on the plain x-ray uh, but which we can uh, see on the, on the bone scan. But MRI scanning actually permits us also to look at uh, more detail, for example, men who have spinal cord compression uh, to see uh, the evidence of compression on the spinal cord or compression on um, nerve roots. There are three broad areas that can be considered in metastatic prostate cancer. There are firstly the men who have biochemical relapse, so the men who've had radical local treatment and subsequently have a rising PSNA. Now a percentage of those men it will be just local relapse but for some of them it's actually going to be the forerunner of them going on to develop metastatic disease at some point. And so we have the big conundrums around how we best manage uh, that, that group of men. I'm not going to go into any detail about that today. We have the men with overt metastatic prostate cancer. Um, they may or may not be <coughs> symptomatic and they may or may not have extensive or more limited disease. And it's those variations that therefore create some of the variability in how we have to manage some of these men. And an increasingly important group of men with metastatic prostate cancer are those who ultimately go on and develop 
uh, castrate resistant or so-called hormone refractory metastatic prostate cancer. So these are the men who may have been managed on andro androgen deprivation or hormonal therapy for a period of time whose prostate cancer then starts to progress again and whose cancer will be less or non-responsive to further hormone therapy. And this is a particularly difficult group of men to manage, but again, the approach to how they might be managed very much is going to depend on whether they've got symptoms or not, on their performance status, and increasingly, with the use of particularly docetaxel chemotherapy, whether or not they've had prior chemotherapy in their management. I want to just say a bit about guidelines, and these are just represent examples of some guidelines. Um, if we go particularly to uh, the Australian guidelines here, actually quite a good document, but perhaps a bit out, getting a bit out of date now. Uh, could do with a bit of refreshing. Uh, another guideline actually, which is for men and their families, which I think is actually quite a good document. Again, could be updated. We've got just the recent uh, European Association of Urology guidelines. But of course it covers all urologic conditions, so you've really got to delve into it uh, to find out about metastatic prostate cancer and the NICE guidelines which have recently been published. The point I want to make out, out about this is that New Zealand probably does need something that is usable and useful for us here. Uh, and so we need to take some of what's contained in these and other guidelines and actually look at something that is, is, is suitable to provide both guidance to, to clinicians, to, to provide a broad framework, um, as well as to provide the basis for good, further good information that can be given to men who have metastatic uh, prostate cancer. Androgen deprivation therapy remains the mainstay of initial therapy for most men, particularly those men who have symptomatic um, metastases from prostate cancer. The point about it though, although it can provide extremely good palliation, it does come at a cost potentially of the side effects from androgen deprivation therapy. It doesn't provide a cure, but good management, and some studies show that careful use of androgen deprivation therapy may extend or improve survival. So what we can say about the standard androgen deprivation therapies that are available, I'm going to talk about the details of that in a minute, is that it does provide high rates of, of symptomatic improvement. What we can say is the median progression-free survival for men who go on to androgen deprivation therapy, wide range of about 10 to 20 months, um, and that a proportion of men, possibly as high as 20%, actually will survive for quite long periods of time. So what is androgen deprivation therapy about? I put this in because I knew I was going to have a wide range of people in the audience here. Well, it's actually essentially about blocking the drive of prostate cancer growth from the stimulus caused by testosterone. And so the various forms of androgen deprivation therapy we have are, are aimed at, at, at trying to achieve that. Um, and so what we can do with our therapies is we can, um, we can block the drive from the hypothalamus on the, on the testes to produce testosterone, or we can actually block the effects of testosterone um, on prostate cancer cells. So there are a number of approaches that can be taken. And here are, is a table, which I'm not going to go into any detail on, about the range of androgen deprivation therapies that are available in this country. And the most commonly used approaches to androgen deprivation therapy are to either use goserelin or, or, or luprolin uh, as an approach of blocking the action from the pituitary on the testis and therefore inhibit the production of, of, of testosterone. However, there are also a range of uh, both steroidal antiandrogens and non-steroidal antiandrogens that are also available. 
um, and uh, magesterol acetate and cyproterone acetate uh, being steroid antiandrogens that suppress the activity of the pathway in the adrenal gland um, as part of the production in testosterone. And then we have a number of agents by clutamide and flutamide that are non-steroidals that actually block androgen receptors on, on the prostate cancer cells. So in terms of biochemical relapse, where you might be suspicious that that relapse is, it may be an onset for, for metastatic disease, to, to actually just point out that the time can be quite variable from PSA failure to when metastatic disease develops. But what we know is if the PSA rises slowly, then a lesser proportion of men at seven to ten years will develop metastases, but where there's a rapid rise, then a much higher proportion will develop metastatic disease. In this group of men, the optimum timing of androgen deprivation therapy basically still remains unknown, but actually a TROGA, a trans-Australian New Zealand study, has, has just recently closed and is currently undergoing analysis looking at the timing of androgen deprivation therapy in patients with a rising PSA. And I think that's going to be quite an important study, and David might be able to say something more about that. Now, androgen deprivation theory, uh, therapy, one of the things that has to be considered is whether one comes in early with it or with, whether one delays it. What we can say is it would appear that if you do come in early with it, there's probably not a huge benefit in terms of survival. And so, therefore, careful judgments have to be made about the optimum timing for individual men. What we can say is that the LHRH agonists, which are those agents that, that act at the level of the pituitary gland, give an equivalent benefit to doing an orchidectomy, uh, that is removing the testes. We know that where monotherapy is given, um, and I'm talking now about either the non-steroidal or steroidal antiandrogens, that using those as single agents probably does result in shorter survival. However, using those agents may sometimes be useful because they might have a balance of more acceptable toxicity for some patients. Um, but overall, the survival they produce and has been shown from a number of meta-analyses does seem to be somewhat smaller. With androgen deprivation therapy, um, there has been a, quite a number of studies looking at the effect of what is called total androgen blockade. So what you do is you use a drug, you, you either block um, the action from the pituitary and, and you also block by using a, um, a non-steroidal antiandrogen. The meta-analyses show there may be a small benefit in terms of survival and a reduction in mortality but that benefit is actually really quite small and it does come at the cost of potentially increased side effects from the effect of the, of the total blockade. However, using a total blockade at the start can be beneficial because if, if one starts uh, by using the agents that block the pituitary gland, one of the problems that can be seen clinically in some men with advanced prostate cancer is a so-called flare response or a temporary increase in, in symptoms and that can be suppressed by initially using a, a complete blockade. Another area around which there has been published just interesting work from a study is around the issue, issue of whether or not when you start androgen uh, deprivation therapy, whether you continue that until progression of disease or whether in fact you give that treatment intermittently. It would seem from one of the more recent studies that if you use it continuously, there may be a small benefit in terms of median survival. But again, giving it continuously comes at the cost of potentially a risk of more problems with ongoing side effects, whereas if you use it intermittently, you can give men, if you like, 
quotes, a, a drug holiday for a period of time. Not going to go through this in detail, but just to indicate the range of side effects that androgen deprivation therapy uh, can cause. And with the more common ones on your left hand side and the less common ones on, on the right hand side. And so many of you in this room will be well aware of the issues that can occur with hot flushes, with um, erectile dysfunction, with decreased libido, weight gain, all the sorts of problems that occur in men uh, when they're deprived of the, the driving effects of testosterone. Now one of the problems with the use of androgen deprivation therapy, particularly for those men who've been on it or are on it for long periods of time, can be uh, the development of osteoporosis. And there have been a number of approaches to try and counteract that. However, it can be said that at best the approaches using agents such as uh, zoledrenic acid have at best probably been marginal in terms of their, in terms of their benefits. Now comes chemotherapy and there has been recently published and updated at ASCO this year, a major international meeting, looking at the early use of docetaxel in combination with androgen deprivation therapy and reporting an apparently very significant difference in terms of the median survival for the men who have docetaxel and that that benefit may actually be even greater for the men who have more extensive disease. And that they also these men have a greater reduction in their PSA if you want to use that as an objective measure of response. So this is very much watch this space. The Americans have said that this is potentially a game changing approach to treatment and I think we are certainly going to see more in this space over the, over the next few years. <coughs> I, being a radiation oncologist, I just want to make sure that everyone in this room is clear that radiotherapy has a very important and significant role in the management of metastatic prostate cancer. And particularly for the management of bone metastases, it is a very quick and effective treatment. Uh, it can be not only useful for reducing pain, can be useful in circumstances where men may be at risk of fracture and certainly for the more significant complications of spinal cord or nerve root compression can be a, a very effective treatment. And I think we've got to be careful to understand that although men may be having an effective systemic treatment, that doesn't lessen the need to consider that many men will need to have radiotherapy as a component of, of that treatment. There can be various approaches to treatment and little evidence in terms of pain relief at least that it, it matters in terms of the sort of radiation dose that's, that's given. However, I've put down there the question of oligometastases, that is men with prostate cancer who have very limited disease, who may have a significantly longer life expectancy where it may be appropriate to, to give them a more aggressive approach in terms of the, the radiation dose. Ultimately though, most men on androgen deprivation therapy will become hormone refractory. And then depending on their performance status at that time, the extent of the impact of their metastases, one then needs to consider how we manage castrate resistant prostate cancer. I've got a definition up there, it simply means that a man who is fully suppressed, and that is has, has low, uh, low testosterone levels and has two to three significant rises in the PSA or has documented progression of disease and has been on good androgen deprivation therapy is, is by definition then hormone, uh, hormone resistant um, prostate cancer. Now many clinicians will actually continue ADT after progression, however it's fair to say that when one looks carefully at the evidence there's actually little good evidence to necessarily base the decision to continue the androgen deprivation theory. So and for some men at least, it is sometimes reasonable to, to withdraw that. Now there are a range of options and some of these are newer options which are not yet available for men in New Zealand but 
hopefully maybe at some point. Albiaraterone acetate, which is an inhibitor of andro androgen biosynthesis, is an, an exciting drug on which there are now a number of studies reporting its benefit. Um, enzalutamide is an androgen receptor inhibitor, again, which seems to be showing good effect in, in men with otherwise uh, hormone-resistant disease. Uh, docetaxel, I've already mentioned, another analogue of that, carbotaxel, and an older chemotherapeutic agent, mitoxantrone, which, while the studies have shown it doesn't appear to improve overall survival, can be of useful palliative benefit to some men. And there is a, a, a therapeutic vaccine, which is very expensive, again, not shown to improve survival, but reported to have improved symptoms for some men. And an antifungal uh, agent, which also has strong an a anti-androgen effects, which is available in New Zealand, can be of benefit for a small number of men. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the use of bisphosphonates. That is, if you like, agents to improve the turnover in bone to reduce the risk for, for complications. Actually, the evidence for their use in prostate cancer is actually rather conflicting and, and limited. And the only agent which seems to have consistently shown that there may be some benefits is zoledrenic acid. And there has been a, a recently, or not so long ago, reported study showing it does significantly reduce bone pain in up to half the men who have it, and does seem to reduce in a small proportion of men, about one in nine, reduce the uh, incidence of uh, skeletal-related events. Another approach which can be and has been taken in men with uh, hormone-resistant prostate cancer is the use of radioisotopes. Strontium-89 has been around for a long time. It is very effective for pain relief. Um, it appears there's probably no clear survival benefit, but there are some risks of haematologic toxicity and particularly concerns uh, for men who've ha previously been heavily pretreated with cytotoxic chemotherapy. Another radioisotope which we're going to hear more about and which we're starting to hear more about, radium-223, and a recently completed study which shows that actually men that have this isotope do appear to have a small but significant improvement in median survival. Uh, that it does appear that this particular isotope may delay skeletal complications for men. And perhaps interestingly, that the men that in the randomised study that this data is based on actually seem to have improved quality of life over those men that didn't have radium. So chemotherapy certainly need, comes into its own for men who've got hormone-resistant prostate cancer and just some of the issues there about where we need the considerations we need to make in terms of when we might use chemotherapy. I've already mentioned uh, these two newer anti-androgens and just to say that in hormone resistant prostate cancer it appears both these drugs probably improve uh, median survival and that both of them do produce useful responses and possibly uh, a better quality of life. But of course, again, they come at a cost, and I'm not going to go into any detail here, but just an outline of the, the range of side effects from those particular agents. And in terms of chemotherapy, mitoxantrain and steroids, and docetaxel and prednisone, again, chemotherapy comes at the cost of side effects. There are a range of other non-chemotherapy options, and again, I mentioned radiotherapy is useful. And finally, while I've had, I, I guess, a very much a medical focus, I'm just putting two final uh, slides up here to, just to now just mention the fact that psychosocial care for these men has an important place, and we could do far better in this country around uh, these issues. And we also need a lot more research into it, particularly in relation to men with prostate cancer. When one looks at the literature, there's often a lot that's related 
broadly to metastatic cancer, but a lot of it doesn't specifically necessarily address the, the needs of men. Men do need a lot more information and there is a need for better education. There is a need for better support around the psychosocial interventions. An area which I think is critically important, it's certainly come out of the literature around lung cancer, is the important role of exercise and physical activity in counteracting uh, the effects of fatigue and counteracting particularly some of the effects of androgen deprivation therapy in terms of loss of muscle bulk and the fatigue that that can cause. More work and research around the impact on sexuality, the problems of depression and anxiety, and I'm pleased to note there's a group that did disappear out of the work, the room, to actually look at the issues around support for, for partners of, of men with prostate cancer. And finally, to indicate, again, there is good evidence out there to show that early coordinated care, palliative care, actually does improve men's quality of life and does improve the satisfaction with the care they receive. And there is a very important role for men with metastatic prostate cancer around advanced care planning, around the other approaches to symptom control apart from hormone treatment, um, and also ultimately for those men who are in the phase of dying about the provision of good coordinated care in their dying. Now what am I final messages. I wrote a, a quick note so that I wouldn't forget them. Um, and, and my key message out of this is that we do need some good guidance for New Zealand and we do need better information for men. We do need better data for men in terms of men with metastatic prostate cancer as to what happens in their care in New Zealand. We definitely need more research and ongoing research around both the patterns of delivery of care to men with metastatic prostate cancer, but also continuing work around the better identification of options for treatment of men. And we certainly do need uh, a lot more work uh, around looking at how we better support men and their families. Thank you.